Aloha. <laughs> Mahala. Um, so Joshua, thanks very much for the kind introduction. Can everyone hear me who wants to? <laughs> How's this? No, no. Um, thank you all for also getting up uh, early and coming down and to hear what is pretty much bound to be a pretty gloomy presentation. You know, <laughs> I mean, what do you expect from a guy that writes books called The End of Oil and The End of Food? Um, and I got, and I got, as an aside, I have to tell you, my, my son, my own son, who's 12, tells me, you know, Dad, you might want to come up with a book title that induces people to buy the book. So, <laughs> <laughs> so his, his suggestion for my next book is, he wants, he's uplifting, optimistic, so his suggestion is um, The Beginning of Cake. <laughs> Thank you, Isaac. But you know, so, so the end of food, what was this about? Well, I mean, at the time that I was beginning this book, food prices hadn't begun their historic spike. And so it didn't appear to me that we were at the end of the food supply. It was more that we'd sort of run out of confidence in the system responsible for producing that food supply. You know, and, and you, know, you could not swing a cat without running into a news story about some new calamity in the food system. You know, pathogens of every kind on every, you know, on our spinach and our peanut butter, our ground beef, our tomatoes, or was it chilies? And we had, uh, you know, tainted imports from Mexico and China. And we had a billion people nearly worldwide that couldn't get enough to eat, and another billion who were getting too much to eat. And in between that, we had this agribusiness model that was, you know, busily using up all the water and destroying all the soil that we need to produce the food in the first place. So. You know, everyone in this room has kind of known about these things for decades. But what was striking in the last few years was that even mainstream consumers and producers were starting to feel a little anxious about the, what they were eating, what they were putting in their mouths. And what was even more striking was it looked as if we were getting some action, some changes in behavior. If you go back a year, like last summer with high food prices and high energy costs, we were seeing changes in behavior, the way people were, were sort of dealing with food. Um, high food costs, people were uh, cooking more. They were sort of de-industrializing their diets in order to drive down costs. And with higher energy costs, higher transportation costs, suddenly this sort of global supply chain model didn't seem very tenable. And you, you had food distribution companies saying, I can no longer afford to bring in food from the tip of South America all the way to Alaska. I'm going to have to rely more on regional suppliers. I might even have to rely on local suppliers. And all of a sudden, Regional and local suppliers appear to have this economic advantage. And you begin to see changes in the food system that you know, we've been sort of pushing for for decades with mixed success, and yet they're happening. They said they're happening automatically. We're not having to do anything. The revolution's sort of picking up by itself. And, and you know, given that we have been pushing at this for so long, it was a pretty welcome development. And then what happens? Sort of the bottom falls out. Prices come down, and a lot of the mainstream consumers and producers revert to the behavior that what they were doing before. So, 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 so what happened? Well, I mean, we can we can say, okay, well, prices will come back, and 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 you know, we can argue that the the revolution will continue as soon as prices come back up. But the truth is, and and everyone in this room knows this, that this revolution is not going to do itself. It's not going to operate by itself. The market is not going to fix this problem for us. I mean, the market is probably, if not the most, it's one of the most powerful forces on the planet. And, and we're not going to build the next food system without the market's help. But the market by itself is not going to do this. We're going to have to make this revolution happen the old-fashioned way. We're going to have to make it happen. And I think that's the lesson of this last uh, price cycle episode. For as tempting as it is to believe that the market can do this for us, I think what we're realizing is it can't. Now, how do we go about making the revolution happen? Well, we continue doing what we have been doing. We, we work on making our own value propositions better. We become better entrepreneurs. But at the same time, and more importantly, more fundamentally, we have to become better at articulating why we need a revolution in the first place. Why is it that we need an alternative revolution? You know, what is it about the alternative revolution that's going to be beneficial? More importantly, what is it about the status quo that isn't working? Because you have to, you have to keep in mind that for an awful lot of mainstream consumers and producers, the status quo is actually working. Yes, there are some problems with the system. There are some safety problems. There are some problems with the contamination. Maybe the agribusiness model is producing a lot of pesticides that are getting into the water. 
But for the most part, most consumers believe those are individual problems that can be solved individually. If you've got safety problems at food plants, just hire more inspectors. If you've got contaminated food coming in from China, you need tougher border controls. We need to do a better job of articulating why these problems are not separate, why they're not discrete, why you can't treat them singly. We need to do a better job of articulating, as a community, why these problems are actually symptoms of a deeper problem, which is essentially and a food system that's become so industrialized it's moving past the point of diminishing returns. In other words, we need to tell a better story here. We need to remind people that it's not simply a matter of hiring more inspectors. I mean, sure, we can take the CEO of the Peanut Corporation and, and put the guy in jail, but we're going to also have to address the larger system that allowed the food from that plant to move through our food economy so quickly that it was in people's houses and in their stomachs before regulators even knew there was a problem. That's going to take far more than passing tougher regulations or putting people in jail. So we're going to need a better, we're going to need a better story, a better narrative that, that, it, that, that explains where these problems came from. Too often when we in the alternative community talk about these problems, it's as if the problems were dropped on us from outer space or more likely from greedy corporations. The truth is, most of the problems we're dealing with today, they have a history. They began some time ago. They involve a complex interplay of factors and players. There's a story behind them. And, and, and most ironically, most of the problems we're dealing with began some time ago as what? As solutions. They began as someone's well-intended, but perhaps ill-considered, attempt to solve an earlier problem. That's the story we've got to get out there because until mainstream consumers and producers understand that, they will continue to focus on problems as single events. And they will not look at the entire system. So what I want to talk to you today about is coming up with a new story, a new way to frame this debate that takes in the comprehensiveness of the story, that looks at it from beginning to end, and helps people understand that the problem is far more complex than simply dealing with more inspectors or tougher border controls and that the solutions will have to reflect that complexity. And, and the way I've been doing it is drawing on my own experiences researching the food industry and interacting with food and coming up with ways, stories, that explain how things began. Things that began as solutions and turned into problems. And, and the hope is that when someone reads these things, they understand that you know, it's not a simple thing to fix this. Now, I'm not suggesting you take the examples I'm about to give you as your own, but I am hoping it might provoke you to reach into your own experience, your own perspective, your own dealings with your sector, and come up with new ways to frame problems that you've been dealing with for decades. Now, the one I'd like to start with today is a, sort of a classic in the annals of food screw-ups. And it uh, begins in um, post-World War II, Hudson River, fishermen, they notice something bizarre about the fish. The fish are getting bigger every year. Now, most fishermen don't complain about big fish, but in this case, because these fish were being hooked downstream from a pharmaceutical laboratory, there was some concern that the effect was not entirely natural. And eventually, these stories get back to the, the company itself, and uh, there's a, a staff scientist named Thomas Jukes. And Jukes begins to wonder whether something the company is making is getting into the water. And he, he looks at their new hot new product, it's tetracycline. And, and he, he, it's made through a fermentation process and the waste product is, is mash. It's basically fermented mash, which the company keeps in these big piles next to the river. That's what they say. They probably just put the piles right into the river. But the point is that somehow the mash is getting into the river and probably into the fish. So Jukes begins experimenting. He's feeding little, little bits of the mash to chicks and he discovers that they get bigger faster on the same amount of feed and he, he speculates correctly that the the antibiotics getting into the guts of these little guys these little critters and it's killing off all the the bugs and because the the chicken the chick is no longer using its calories to fight off infection it of course can use the calories to become bigger and stronger and he tests this on on all kinds of different animals it works everywhere whether you're talking chickens turkeys donkeys uh, cows cows give more milk uh, pigs give bigger litters uh, the birth weight is bigger and, and on, all on the same feed, 25% faster growth. And it feels pretty much like free meat if you, if you consider that feed is the most expensive part of a livestock, most, the biggest cost for a livestock producer. And keep in mind that at the time, this is just after World War II, the United States still has meat shortages, we've got high prices. Worldwide, it's, it's, it's close to a disaster. We've got massive protein deficit. You know, entire populations are at deep risk. 
So the idea that we can produce meat cheaply, it feels very much like a miracle, a solution. Now, the, the practice of sub-therapeutic antibiotics would be one of the pillars of what we would later call the livestock revolution. It essentially allowed us to produce a lot of meat very cheaply. It changed the global diet in many ways for the better. Completely changed the way we looked at food security. Now that was the good news. The bad news, and it would be several decades before we were forced to confront this, was that there were problems associated with feeding a lot of antibiotics to your livestock. I mean, the first, of course, is that, you come, that the livestock industry has become totally addicted to antibiotics. More than two-thirds of the antibiotics we generate on this planet are fed to our animals. The other problem is, of course, as you know, if you feed just small doses of antibiotics to animals, you don't kill off all the bacteria. You, get, you just kill the weak ones. The strong ones, of course, survive, produce populations of these superbugs, which are resistant to antibiotics. Now, I know this is all quite familiar to you, but keep, put this in context. Consider what we're, we're, what we're sort of creating here. We're, we're setting ourselves up for a time when we don't have recourse to antibiotics. You know, my son, when he has an ear infection, I was able to go to the clinic and pretty uh, dependably get that cured. The idea that I wouldn't have recourse to antibiotics for something as simple as an ear infection is pretty frightening, and the news only gets worse. If you consider that we won't have treatment for infectious disease, this was not what Thomas Jukes set out to do. Thomas Jukes was not trying to destroy the world. The problem was that Thomas Jukes came from a scientific tradition that believed that the best way to save the world, or at least to understand it, was to pull it apart, break it into its pieces, analyze those pieces, improve those pieces, and then reassemble them, ideally in a more efficient configuration. And this is what we were doing to the food system. And this is what we've done in other sectors. I mean, we've done it in manufacturing, we try to do it in banking with, you know, mixed results. <laughs> And we would proceed over the course of the last century to do it through the food system. The idea is that by breaking things apart, by rationalizing, by industrializing, we can drive down costs, improve efficiency, and, it, and, and essentially create a system that's much more productive. And for a time, it absolutely did work. We were able to drive down food costs substantially. When you adjust food prices for inflation and look at what's happened over the last century, it is phenomenal. You really need to do that just to understand how far we've come and also to understand some of the resistance to some of the solutions that we're going to talk about. Because we have, we, we've, ch we've so changed the notion of food security and the, and the whole sort of dynamic for food production that you really begin to see the corner that we've painted ourselves into. But so the good news is we drove costs down, the bad news is we began to understand that you can, you know, there's a weak link in this industrialization of food and the weak link is, it's food. Food doesn't like to be industrialized. I don't want to anthropomorphize food here, but Food resists being commodified. Past a certain point, food will push back. And it's this pushback that is the nexus of many of the problems we're dealing with today. I mean, let's, let's consider an analogy. If, if, if we're going to uh, mass produce TV sets and we're going to try to make them as efficiently and cost effectively as possible, then we want to centralize our production in huge plants because, because what? We, we drive down our unit costs. And we want to be able to get our raw materials from as many different suppliers as possible. In fact, we'd like to make those suppliers compete. We'd like to pit one supplier against another to drive down the cost even further. And then inside the plant, we want total flexibility in our production lines. We want to be able to start and stop production, change design in order to meet the changing marketplace. And lastly, we want to be able to take those finished products and ship them to end users, to retailers and consumers as quickly as possible because we don't want to pay holding costs. Now this is an efficient system I'm talking about. And when we're using it to make TVs, it's great. I mean, to the extent that we like TVs. <laughs> Maybe I should have picked something else. <laughs> iPods. But now let's transfer this technology, this model, to food. Let's look at, say, ground beef. <coughs> ground beef today is made very much in the same way. We take, uh, we take well, and you've all finished eating. Um, <laughs> or, or you will be, I guarantee you. Ground beef today is made, uh, in many cases, from spent dairy cows. These are dairy cows that are no longer giving a, a, an economic volume of milk every day. Problem is that they're fairly lean. They don't produce juicy ground beef, so we have to juice up the meat by buying fat from other feedlots. So what you have is these huge processing centers, and we're talking gigantic, with, feed, with input streams coming from feedlots all over the country, and sometimes further many different feedlots all coming into the same location mixed together in these enormous batches. We're talking multi-ton batches. 
And these batches are mixed, and then they are shipped to other uh, processors who may then mix them with still more batches, or they may begin to make them into products like hamburger patties, pizza toppings, and these are then shipped on to the end user. Now, when this system works, it's fantastic. I mean, we're talking about driving down costs. This is one of the main tools for driving down costs. The problem is when it doesn't work, when an error is introduced into the system, that error moves through the system as quickly as the ground beef did. And we had a, we had a classic example of this two years ago with Topps Meat. You know, here is a, the biggest ground beef frozen patty producer in the United States, presumably someone who knew something, a thing or two about food safety, and yet they had a human error. They mixed one batch with another. And the problem is one of those batches had E. coli in it. And once that E. coli was mixed, they couldn't contain it. It was gone. It was gone. It was out. The only thing they could do was recall all their meat for months. 23 million pounds of hamburger. Think about it. 23 million pounds. I can't quite do the math, but it's a lot of tons. And then what, what did they do? They went out of business. So consider this as a, a model of sustainability, not environmental health, but economic sustainability. Here you have a company that, you know, is, is the system that it uses, the model that it uses, is, will inevitably um, have an error because it's, there are human beings involved. And then once that error is introduced, the error will move th so quickly through the product stream that it's impossible to contain. So the only recourse the company has is to recall its entire product line, at which point it goes bankrupt. This is the, this, and, and this model that I've just described, it's not confined to the ground beef industry. It's pretty much how most of the food system is run. You know, we like to think that it's just fast food, but I'm afraid that fast food nation is now the entire nation. And this is the system we have. This is the system. So what were the takeaways here? Well, a couple of takeaways are that, you know, we have approached food as if it were not a system. We spent the last century trying to talk ourselves into the notion that food is not a coherent system, that it can be pulled apart. And this is, this is completely shaped the way that we solve our problems, because we solve our problems as if they were independent problems. We don't recognize that the whole system is set up like whack-a-mole. It's where you whack something down, it pops up somewhere else. And that is the dynamic of a, of a living system. And yet we treat our food sector as if it were not a living system. So the first takeaway is that you know, most of the problems that we're dealing with today began as solutions. And the second is, if we don't embrace this systems approach, and if we don't get better at conveying and articulating this, the, this, the nature of this system, then every attempt at solving problems today is simply going to turn into a problem for our kids and their grandkids. That's the takeaway. Now in terms of stories, what you'll often find when you go back and look and, and try to put a narrative around this, you begin realizing that many of the problems begin with a particular company or a particular product. In the case of, um, one of my favorites is, has to do with McDonald's, I mean naturally, who else? And, and with a product that they came up with in the 1970s. Now the background is, McDonald's in the 1970s needed a new meat, because beef had become very expensive. You recall we had another grain price spike because of the Russian um, grain situation, beef prices go up, McDonald's, uh, and, and at the same time, the medical community just announced that beef is poison. So here's McDonald's, which has pretty much built its business model around beef and a few french fries, desperate for a new meat. And the meat it settles on is what? It's chicken. Why? Chicken is supposedly more healthy than beef, although McDonald's would fix that. <laughs> I know none of you have eaten there, but I'm just, I'm, I'm telling you about this so that you'll know when you leave. Second was that chicken was least offensive ethnically. And this was critical because McDonald's at that time had great plans to go global. So it needed a sort of a ethnically neutral meat. Third and most importantly, chicken is most amenable to some of the new food processing technologies that were just coming to the fore then, including something called mechanical separation. Now for the few of you who don't know what mechanical separation is, I'll tell you. It's where you essentially take whatever you're, you're processing, in this case chicken, and you run it through a sieve. And you end up with what they call a slurry, their term. And, and this slurry then, to that you add various uh, flavorings, salt, fixatives, and turn it into a paste. And then this paste you can form into shapes. You can make patties or, or franks or nuggets, nuggets. yes. Okay, and, and, and they had this great idea. With nuggets, they were going to form them into these, they call them finger-sized nuggets, and bread them and deep fry them in essential plants, and then flash freeze them, ship them out to their franchises who would then reheat and serve them with dipping sauces. Now you remember this. I don't know if you remember how successful they were. They were introduced in 1982, and people lined up around, the, around these stores to get their nuggets. 
I mean, and by the end of the year, McDonald's is the second big, and a, a hamburger outlet is the second biggest seller of chicken in the country. It was huge. And of course, as soon as McDonald's has this kind of success, every other fast food place has to begin selling chicken. And even the slow food places have to begin selling chicken. And retailers like Safeway begin have to, having to move frozen chicken in their, in their freezer cases. Chicken becomes the huge thing. So chicken farmers, of course, begin rapidly expanding their flocks. And it's like a chicken revolution. But, but here's the thing. It wasn't just that we needed more chicken. We needed a different kind of chicken. Because it turns out that the, 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 the traditional chicken no longer fit the market. See, Americans needed white meat. We prefer white meat, apparently. And white meat's more amenable to processing. Dark meat doesn't stick together as well. So we needed more white meat. The problem is the average chicken only had a certain amount of white meat on it. So the chicken no longer matched the market. So we needed to come up with a chicken with bigger breasts. And we did. It was, the, the breeders went to work coming up with a new, new proportions for the chicken. And they, they decided while they're at it, they would just come up with a chicken that was larger all the way around and grew faster for less feed. And when you look at the numbers, it is, it is striking what we have been able to do. I use the we loosely here. In the mid-1930s, when the poultry industry begins to commercialize, it took about 16 weeks for a bird to reach a slaughter weight of between two and a half and three pounds. 16 weeks, so about four months, to get a bird up to about three pounds. Today, it takes five to six weeks to get a bird up to seven pounds. Which, you know, it's, I mean, if you've ever seen these Cornish crosses that you can raise at home, they're huge. And, you know, they're so huge they can't even walk past adolescence which is pretty much where the industry offs them because at that point their growth curve stops being economic. And they are not gonna you know, get old enough to reproduce. So I mean, they are, they're, they're, they're out of luck all the way around. So here we have this enormous chicken, huge breasts, problem solved, no. Because it turns out we not only need a big bird, we need a super, super cheap bird. Because now, now we're in the 1980s and McDonald's and all the other fast food places have embarked on price wars. Remember the 99 cent whatever or the 59 cent whatever, and chicken was the weapon of mass destruction. And these companies, later, and later the Walmarts of the world, would go to the big poultry producers and they'd say, look, we are your biggest customer, so you will drive your cost down. And, and in fact, not only are you going to drive your cost down, but you're going to let us come in and look at your books and you're going to show us how much you're spending on these birds. And we'll negotiate what your profit margin should be. And, and, so, and, and so, of course, the Pilgrim's Pride and the Tysons, they responded like they always do. They got a lot bigger, and they automated. Um, the, the plant back in the 1980s, uh, a poultry producer could be profitable, could, could break even, if he had four plants and a, a, an annual output of about 35 uh, million birds a year. I guess that's annual. Today, to be profitable, you need um, two much larger plants and about a quarter billion birds coming out a year. That's just to break even. And, and a company like Tyson, I'm not suggesting that we feel sympathy for Tyson, just recognize the reality they're dealing with. You know, their per pound profit margin is two and a half cents. And given that there's about four to five pounds a maximum of meat, edible, you know, weight meat on a bird, they're looking at about a dime a profit per bird. And really the only way to grow your profits is to produce more birds, so that's what they've been doing. So we've reached this model where it begins, presumably at the consumer, we're driving this, right, because we'll only eat food if it gets cheaper every year, and this moves through the retail sector, and that signal is sent to the producer who then responds, and now we have a, a, a chicken model that can produce fabulously cheap chicken. And, and it, when you look at the inflation adjusted figures, since 1980, the, the, um, the cost of a chicken breast has dropped by a factor of four. So it is very cheap. And that's the good news, if you will. The bad news is when you start looking at the external costs, the price that we've paid to get chicken like that. You know, we've, we've automated, this is true, and you know, we now, the, the line, the, the line speed, the, the speed with which these birds move through the processing plant has gone so fast that um, the uh, inspectors have about two seconds per bird. I don't know how much information they can actually glean in less than two seconds with each bird. Um, although we have automated much of the process, still a lot of the work is done by hand. And if you ever look at a raw breast, chicken breast in the store, you'll notice cut marks on it. And those cut marks are almost in all cases evidence of someone's hand. And this is one of the hardest jobs. If you've ever cleaned a bird, as I'm sure most of you have, you know how hard it is. Imagine doing you know, many, many of those an hour. Yet that is simply a cost 
that, or that's simply a, an external cost uh, of doing business in this sector. Um, probably last but not least, uh, if you look at the, um, the safety record of, these, if, uh, of the chicken that's going through here, um, through the early 2000s, the risk of, say, Campylobacter was actually declining. Now it's going back up. And one of the biggest, one of the big concerns we have is that may be built into the system. Now, when we look at, I guess the last thing is these companies have had to go and find lower cost supplies, which is really wh what we were doing in China. I mean, why else would we have gone to China for wheat gluten and soy protein? And think about this with China. Here's a country that is infamous for producing sub-quality clothes, consumer electronics, and toys. And yet we thought it would be okay to get our food from them. <laughs> I mean, the Chinese are utterly aware of this. And they were working very hard to correct this problem. But China is essentially where we were 100 years ago when Sinclair wrote The Jungle. They're rapidly industrializing their food system, and yet they don't have a regulatory system that can keep up. The estimates I've seen, these are conservative estimates, suggest the Chinese need to spend more than $100 billion to bring their food system up to minimum Western standards. And the fact that food is cheap from China simply reflects that this money has not been spent. So, you know, that is, that is, that, that is where, that is where we've, we've gotten ourselves with the sort of the quest for cheap food and with the misapprehension of the system's nature of food. Now, when food companies are aware of this and they are striving, striving, and even the big food companies are striving to fix this because they recognize that there is a flaw when you kill your customers. <laughs> it's not a sustainable business model. And so they're looking, they're looking at issues like antibiotics and they're saying, all right, fine. You don't want us to feed our animals antibiotics? We can do that. And there have been, there have been experiments in the mainstream poultry sector to reduce the antibiotics that are going into the birds. But here we go right back to that notion of addressing a single problem without looking at how it fits into the larger system. When you reduce the amount of antibiotics going into a chicken, what happens? And you haven't changed any other conditions in that chicken's production. They get sick. And when, they, when chickens get sick, it's sort of a reverse of the process that Thomas Jukes discovered 50 years ago. They get smaller. Now, what's important to keep in mind is that a small bird is a, is a, is a problem in and of itself, but it's especially a problem when you consider it in the context of a processing system that has been designed for birds of a certain size and a certain weight. And when one of these machines, these processing machines, encounters a bird that is too small, it makes mistakes. And I'll spare you all the details, and I'll just accept what is often inside the bird ends up on the outside of the bird. And, this is, and if that bird was diseased to begin with, that is not what you want to have happen. And this is one of the reasons why, as I mentioned before, after we'd seen a steady decline in many of the foodborne diseases associated with poultry through the early 2000s, we've begun to see a rise, particularly in the ground poultry sector. And when, you've, when you go with these, uh, these USDA inspectors into supermarkets, and they do these spot checks of ground turkey and poultry in the supermarkets, the percentage that contains one or more foodborne pathogens is now up to 30% in some sectors. And of course, the argument has always been, well, cook the stuff, you know? Cook the stuff. You know, it's like consumers need to remember that they need to cook the stuff. This is where the kill step is, it's at home. And there's truth to that. We, consumers do need to take responsibility for their own food. I mean, hello. The problem is that in this society, more and more of our cooking is done outside the home. We've sort of outsourced that responsibility to someone. So clearly, Clearly, the idea of just having consumers, well, that, that assumes that consumers are even cooking in the first place. So you can see where you begin what begins as a solution, or at least appeared to be a solution, evolves or devolves into a massive problem. And yet, attempts to solve it that are not systemic in and of themselves simply leave us with another set of problems. Now, I'm, I'm looking at your faces, and I'm reminded, I, sorry, I, I, I was giving a talk on oil in LA a couple years ago, and this woman raised her hand, she said, you know, my, my husband was going to try to be here tonight, but he didn't finish the book. He wanted to finish the book. He's at home. He's about halfway through. He's prone to depression. Should I call him up and tell him to stop reading? <laughs> and, and, you know, so, so I, I mean, you know, I do tend to really push the sort of the bad news side of the equation here. Um, 
and, and why? I mean, if you've just sort of created a new narrative and you're wanting to introduce it to a mainstream audience and you've just succeeded in depressing them to the point of suicide, what have you accomplished? I think, though, that unless you get down to brass tacks and, and help people understand that the system itself is sick, they're going to continue to come back at you with this kind of sense of wonder. It's like, why do you keep wanting to undo the whole system when you can just fix the top? Until they understand the system itself is sick, they're not going to recognize the need for a deeper solution. You know, and they're going to continue to ask for these sort of surface solutions. Once you've addressed complexity, they will recognize that the solutions have to be complex. Or if not complex in themselves, they've got to acknowledge the complexity of the system and of the problems. That's the one thing. The other thing they'll recognize is that there's not going to be any quick solutions, which is important because this is a society that, that expects things to be done quickly. It expects you know, to be able to have a solution in the form of a product that I can go buy. And it says on it organic, or it says on it free range, and that's all I have to think about. This is, the, this is a society that has arisen around this notion of alternative food. The truth is, and we all know this, that those labels don't address the entire uh, complex nature of the system. So until we explain that story fully, we don't have a, a mainstream consumer who's ready to accept that. So once we've addressed this level of complexity, once we've come up with a new story, consumers begin to realize that, again, the solution has to be complex. It won't be quick. But probably most important, they're not going to get their status quo back. They're not going to be able to go back to a system that, did, that externalized costs, that didn't address complexity. And this is going to be the toughest thing to sell, that they may not get a system back that gave them food that was getting cheaper every year, or that allowed them to have pretty much anything they wanted to eat from any part of the world any time of year. I mean, how do you go back and talk about the notion of seasonality? You know, how do you explain that strawberries probably only should be available a few weeks a year, or, or, or maybe, maybe not should, I've got to be careful here, but perhaps there's an argument to be made that strawberries should be available only a few times a year. How do you begin to address that? It's tough. It's really tough. And yet, this is an argument that has at least got to be raised. Now, I, I suppose the final result of a more complex narrative is that people begin to see what the solutions are going to have to look like. And you don't have a, spe a specific solution, but you begin to have a criteria. Again, you notice that the, the solution is going to have to be complex. You notice it's not going to be quick. But then you begin to realize who the players are going to have to be and what they're going to have to do. If we look at the federal government, what is the proper role of the federal government here? Well, right now, the federal government, you know, for 50 years, has simply attempted to move commodities. What's the new role? Right now, we have President Obama, who's attempting to redefine what's the, the food role of the government. And yet we're already starting to see the signs that it's going to have a pretty heavy commodity uh, nature to it. You know, political realities are political realities, but at the same time we also need to recognize the federal government has, has a specific and proper role here. And that is refilling the research pipeline. I mean, politically we're not there yet to begin remaking the food system. We're on the verge, we're moving, we're, we're building awareness. We're not there yet. Let's say we get there in five years. Let's say in five years there's enough critical mass, enough concern, we're ready to do something serious and fundamental and change the system. The problem is we don't have and won't have then the tools we need to fix the system because we've let the research pipeline go completely dry. If you go look at the amount of money this country spends on researching new food technologies, new food methods that are even close to being classified as alternative, it is tiny. We've essentially turned over the research arm to the private sector. We said, you guys do it. You're much better at doing it. And the truth is that the private sector will only attack research problems that show short-term profit potential. I mean, why, would, why, why else, you know, why wouldn't they? It's entirely natural. It is government's rightful job to be tackling those uh, research uh, jobs that aren't profitable now but could be profitable in 10 or 15 years. So that is absolutely essential. So that's the first job. I think the second job is we need to rethink subsidies. Subsidies have gotten a terrible name, and rightly so, because we've been subsidizing the wrong kinds of commodities. But the truth is that if we're going to rebuild the system, we have to recognize that the alternative models that may eventually replace the system we've got today, those models don't have any traction in the marketplace right now. They're not working because the market doesn't even recognize them. Those models are going to need support. That's what we need to be supporting. 
you know, right now um, we need to think about this, the new scales of farming. Clearly we don't need to subsidize gigantic farms, agribusiness. Those farms are actually doing quite well by themselves. What we do need to support is the mid-scale farm. You know, right now the mid-scale farm is the one that's most rapidly disappearing, and yet the mid-scale farm is the most critical, or one of the most critical building blocks in putting together this next food system. Why? Because it's got the scale, the size to get economies of scale to keep prices reasonable, but it's also small enough that that farmer knows every acre and knows how that acre should and shouldn't be farmed. And yet that is the, that is the scale of farm that is disappearing most rapidly. What we're ending up with is a, a hollowing of the middle. We've got farms that are huge and we've got farms that are tiny. And while those are part of the solution, they cannot do this by themselves. And yet we need to support that middle. How do we do that? How do we go about doing that? Well, for years the idea is you support a crop by giving a farmer a per bushel essentially a per bushel refund. We need to rethink how we target our subsidies. It turns out one of the things that drives farmers out of farming is what? Why do farmers end up taking off-farm jobs? Because they can't get health care in many cases. They can't get health care. They end up taking jobs because that's the only way they can afford insurance. Once they've begun taking an off-farm job, the progression has begun. They are, the, the chances that they will leave farming altogether go up. And the chances they'll be able to convince their children to go into farming are almost nil. So how do you reverse that? It may be that the thing we need to subsidize is health care for farmers. This isn't the kind of solution you think about when you're trying to build an alternative food system. It's not romantic. It has nothing to do with hoeing and tilling. But it may be one of the most critical things we can do. Those are the kinds of subsidies we need to start thinking of. You know, and, 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 and we mustn't think necessarily that an alternative food system is going to be so self-sustaining that we don't have to spend any money on it. It's going to be hugely expensive, particularly as we start it. You know, in the same way that consumers are going to need to probably spend more money for food that's truly sustainable, this country is going to need to spend considerably more money to make a food system that's sustainable, particularly at the beginning. We're going to be trying a lot of different things. Many of them will fail. We're in an experimental stage right now. And, and by contrast, the sort of the commodity industrial system has gotten to the point where it doesn't want to experiment. It wants systems where they've, they've pushed the risk out. But once you've pushed the risk out, you've pushed out a chance for innovation. And we're going to have to move back into a sort of an innovation zone. But innovation is inherently risky. So we're moving back into a, a time of risk. The last thing that I think where government can play a role, but this is where it merges both with the community, local, and individual roles, is in coming up with a new way of talking about food. I mean, we're talking about coming up with a new story for the way the alternative community can sort of address these issues and convey this. But we need a new way to talk about food from a government standpoint, too. I mean, schools need a new way to talk about food. You need to be able to, to raise this up. You know, my, my kids go to a great, little, um, a great little school. It's a public school in Washington State. And uh, the teacher decided it's a, it's a K through 5, one teacher, five grades really supportive community. Um, they've got their own garden, um, about, as, uh, about as good a school as you can hope for. And she said, well, she wanted to spend a week teaching kids about food, and about nutrition, about diet, and the way the food decisions they make at home are connected with the larger world. And so she sent home a food diary with each kid and said, I want you just to you know, write down your meals. And about half the kids came back within a couple of days with notes from their parents saying, hell no, we have, you know, you, you mind your own business. Now, this is, a, this is a sort of a rural conservative community and we can make all sorts of sort of guesses as to why that is, but the, the truth is that food is a very personal matter. And it's an ideological and political matter. And when you're talking about, you know, trying to persuade people to change the way they eat, you, as you know, you are on thin ice. You know, so one of the things we need to come up with is a way to have that conversation with an audience that may not be very receptive. I mean, consider the notion of meat. It is absolutely clear that if we were to reduce our meat consumption, we would reduce a lot of the problems that we're talking about today. I mean, I don't, you know, you know what the, the magic ratio, it's eight pounds of grain to a pound of meat. So obviously, every time we increase our meat consumption by, you know, a ton, that's eight tons of grain, 16,000 tons of water, goes right down the line. And when you consider what the rest of the world is doing, if you look in Asia and how their meat intake is going up, you understand why people at the you know, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN panic at night. You have these night sweats when they think about what, you know, they look at future projections. It, how do you begin having that conversation about meat? 
I mean, you know, you, you'll note that <laughs> neither John McCain nor Senator Obama <laughs> talked about meat during the campaign, and yet, if they'd really wanted to address a critical um, factor in climate change, they, it, meat would have been the one. That is simply not something you raise. You know, you know the United States, we consume 220 pounds, or we, we cause to be produced, because a lot is wasted. But each man, woman, and child causes to be produced 220 pounds of meat every year. Now think about that. Compare that with India, where it's about 30 pounds of meat a year. Now, we can all argue the United States is far above the average, and that the global average will never get that high. You know, the Chinese will, what, come to their senses? I mean, what are we anticipating is going to happen? Why wouldn't the rest of the world want to reach our level of meat consumption? I suppose if they spent much time looking at us, they, they might, but I guess... <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the point is that we've got these sort of built-in assumptions about what we think is going to happen simply based on sort of the rest of the world not somehow being able to catch up with us. And, and we all agree that the global average can't be anywhere close to the United States, but we're not ready to sort of acknowledge the United States needs to bring its, its meat level down substantially. So we're agreed to that. But go to the other end of the spectrum. You'll hear a lot of vegetarians saying, this, this food crisis is a perfect opportunity to really push global vegetarianism. And I don't mean, I, you know, look at all the problems we could avoid if we did this. And the, the truth of the matter is, is that you can have a sustainable food system with meat production. It would have to be considerably, the consumption level would have to be considerably lower than ours is, but it can happen. So we can't, we, we have to separate these uh, immoral and sustainability arguments. I mean, the, the notion that, that meat eating is immoral is a totally valid argument. And, I, and it's a totally valid discussion to have. But when we're talking about straight sustainability, you have to be very careful to keep those two things separate. Particularly when you're talking about, a, you go into a developing country. If you go to a place like Kenya and you say, you know, by the way, we really appreciate your efforts to become more food secure and to develop economically. And meantime, you're not going to be able to eat any meat because we've decided that meat eating isn't a good idea. You know, for the, you know, the, first, the first thing is uh, adding meat to the diet uh, improves diet substantially. Doesn't mean you have to eat meat to have a, a, a diet that works. I mean, we know that. But it is one of the quickest ways to improve food security. And second, Raising livestock is one of the stepping stones for economic development in much of the developing world. You know, these people go from having chickens to then goats to then cattle if they're lucky. Meat is their form of wealth. It's walking wealth. And to, to suggest that they somehow do something differently, it, it's, it, 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 it's, it's hugely culturally insensitive. And yet we're going to have to begin to have that conversation. You know, we're talking to China now about joining in a global effort with dealing with climate change. And yet we're focusing almost entirely on coal. We're saying oh, the big fear here is that they're going to keep building you know, more plants. The, you know, China's impact on climate is going to come um, not just from coal and energy, but from livestock. And yet, how do we begin to have that conversation? You know, we're just now getting to the point where we're, we're willing to acknowledge, finally, after eight years of not acknowledging it, that you know, the United States is going to have to lead on reducing its carbon emissions if it, wants, if it expects the rest of the world to do the same thing. What are we going to do about livestock? You know, that is a really tough nut to crack. I guarantee you, although the Obama administration is fully aware of the impacts, the connections between livestock and climate, it is not going to raise that issue. It is simply politically, it's, it's a hot button. So that issue is going to have to be raised at a different level. And yet, how do we as a community begin talking about that in ways that get people to listen? You know, you guys could sit and have conversations all day and agree that reducing meat consumption was critical. But until you find ways to have that conversation outside your community, it's really not going to be effective. So I think the challenges here are really to recognize the problems we've got, recognize the complexity, but come up with new narratives, new ways to discuss these. Narratives that expand the discussion bring in a new audience. And it's an experimental phase. I mean, you're going to have to find, you know, uh, you're going to have to try approaches. Some of them will work, some of them won't. But what's critical is that we start. What's critical is that we recognize that the market, again, is not going to do this for us. I mean, the market's going to assist us. We're not going to be able to do this without the market. But the market by itself will not. We're going to need to make this revolution happen, again, the old-fashioned way. And part of that is going to be with a new story. So with that, I'd like to cease and desist in my story, and um, spend the last time we have with some questions. And I'd be particularly interested in um, some comments about possible stories that people are thinking about coming up with in their own sector, because I'd really like to sort of get a discussion going on 
broadening the narrative. In any case, thank you very much for your time and attention. You've been listening to journalist and author Paul Roberts speaking at the Organic Ecology Conference in Portland, Oregon on February 27, 2009. In a moment, we'll return to the question and answer session from the presentation. Paul Roberts is a longtime observer of energy issues and politics. He has written for the Los Angeles Times, The Washington Post, The Guardian, Slate, USA Today, The New Republic, Newsweek, The Christian Science Monitor, and many other publications. He is author of The End of Oil, On the Edge of a Perilous New World, and his latest book, The End of Food. To find out more about Paul Roberts and his work, please visit his website at theendoffood.com. And now we return to the question and answer segment from the program. Paul Roberts spoke at the Organic Ecology Conference in Portland, Oregon, on February 27, 2009. Susan, Susan has a mic there, but we could also, um, you, could, you could scream and then I could just repeat your question. Oh, no questions. My work is done. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ann. I'm a organic farmer in Western Washington County, here in Oregon. Um, I really like your analysis. I think you really, you know, you talk about the system. It's just great. Uh, but I want to quibble with your interchangeable, in, interchangeable use of the words alternative and sustainable. I don't consider us alternative. I think we're the mainstream. And we need to define ourselves as the mainstream, and that's part of our story. That's a, good... that's a, that's a great point. I mean, that's, uh, allowing yourself to be marginalized by the terminology is probably the first step to, <laughs> to not succeeding. So coming up with a way to sort of redefine yourself as the mainstream, well, how do we begin doing that? I mean, I agree with you, but how do you begin making what you're doing be acceptable and not frightening to the my husband and I are relatively new farmers. This is, this is our 10th season. And so we come at it, you know, from a different point of view. But one of the things we try to do, we call ourselves an open source farm. We invite visitors. We have preschool kids from Portland uh, who come every year to plant pumpkins and then to pink, pick pumpkins. Uh, we've had other school groups and university groups visit us. Um, we are at a farmer's market and we tell our story there. Um, our website isn't really what we want it to be yet, but at least we have one and, and try in a, in a pretty succinct way to say what we're all about. So I think just, you know, you don't need to talk about the whole system to open the conversation. You can just talk about what you do yourself and why you do it. Now, I, I, I guess I agree, but I want to see that approach pushed a little bit farther because right now I think it's very easy for mainstream consumers and consumers generally to view sustainable food, you know, whatever we're going to call this, as something that they can dip into and dip out of sort of as they need. Like if you think about the way that a farmer's market is sort of treated, it's something that you go to when it's in season but it's usually on your way from the Safeway because you couldn't get all the things you, you needed at the farmer's market or they were a little more expensive or you didn't like the spots on the you know, apples or whatever. And yet, you know, so now you've just added another trip to your day, you're booning more energy, you're still using the, the sort of the mainstream system um, and yet you're sort of getting the benefits, some of the benefits of the local system and you're allowed to tell yourself that you've just sort of solved the problem. How do we, I, I think we've got to find a way to sort of talk, you know, help a mainstream consumer understand what are some of the costs of that Safeway system. And I don't mean to pick on Safeway. I mean, that, you know, we're all part of this. Um, and I don't, I don't have a specific answer for you. I, I, I'm, I'm still sort of struggling myself with how do we bring people into this larger conversation without immediately turning them off. You know, I think a lot of people fear alternative food. They fear that once they sign up for that, that they're sort of stuck with it. It's like when you sign up, the first time you sign up for a CSA and you get that gigantic box of food, it's like, you know, zucchini. I mean, great, you know, what am I gonna do with that? I think a lot of people fear that that is what 
an alternative food model means. And I, you know, well, I don't, okay, maybe I'm in the wrong CSA, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Hi, my name is Katie. I work with an organic produce distribution company in um, Los Angeles. And um, my question was, is the next five years seem to be kind of very much a perilous time, especially for food prices. And I hear a lot of things about how um, food prices are kind of depressed right now because of the global recession mm -hmm. that we're in. I never really have understood why that is. I thought maybe you could clarify kind of why, um, you know, because my hope is that maybe um, organics and, and, you know, conventional product will eventually sure. reach some kind of plateau, but I was right. wondering if you had any insight into that. That's a, Katie asked a really good question. It's like, what can, we, and what can we expect from food prices? And is that going to be any help or is it going to be a hindrance to, the, to our sort of our, our larger mission here? Food prices are considerably lower than they were last summer, but they're still 30% higher than they were three years ago. So, um, you know, for a lot of Americans, now food prices, I mean grain prices. Um, for a lot of Americans, food prices have stopped being a, a, as big an issue as they were last summer. For the rest of the world, however, a 30% increase is, can be fatal. And if you look at um, countries that are spending 60 to 70 to 80% of their household income on food, it's still a disaster. So you, on the one hand, you've got the risks of high food prices in the developing world, but in the developed world, they're not quite high enough to provoke the kind of change that we need. So it's a real, it's a paradox. Um, which, uh, I, which goes back, I think, to why we can't really just wait for high food prices to sort of do this work for us. Now, what can we anticipate in terms of food prices? Um, the earlier expectation was that so many farmers had overplanted to take advantage of these high prices that they were now in the middle of retrenching. You have a lot of farmers that are cutting back on acres, and the fear was that the next harvest was going to be so small that we'd be right back into another price spike. It now appears that demand for food has gone down significantly because of the recession, primarily in the form of meat. A lot of developing nations are now eating less meat, which means they've just released a huge quantity of grain back onto the market. They've effectively unwound the grain ratio. So what that means is that we, got, we have a little bit of a respite from higher prices. We'll eventually run into a spike. Um, it, it may be two or three years from now. The danger there is that we sort of go back to sleep. We're going to go back to thinking that food prices are are pretty much steady, and then we're going to find ourselves in the same situation. From the standpoint of, of food advocates, I'm going to just loosely call us food advocates, folks who are advocating change, I don't think we can or should count on high food prices reaching parity with, or with say, organic or alternative foods. I don't think we can count on that as being a driver for this. If we look what happened with uh, food prices last summer. We had some people who were saying, OK, it looks like uh, organic is now the same price as non-organic, so I may as well get organic. That was great. You had also a lot of people saying, I'm just going to eat at McDonald's because McDonald's is cheap. So you have to be very careful about what price signals, what kinds of behaviors that high price signals induce. Um, and, and further, I think we have to go back to that f first point I made, which is that high prices might be useful in this country, but they are disastrous elsewhere in the world. You know, we were actually making progress in reducing the fraction of food insecure people worldwide up until last year, and now that fraction is growing again. And there's a real fear that we're going to see that trend continue. You know, we've had about 50 years of relative freedom from global food insecurity. I don't mean that we'd wiped out hunger by any means, but we had confined hunger to certain regions, sub-Saharan Africa, for example, which we sort of understood to be beset by so many problems that it would take a long time to fix those. But Generally speaking, in Asia in particular, we had essentially gotten a, whole, a handle on food insecurity. And if you think about how food insecurity used to be a huge political issue all the time, it's after, when we came out of World War II, that was the big thing we were worried about, that the world was going to collapse, Asia was going to collapse because of food insecurity and fall into the hands of the communists. And it was a big part of our foreign policy, was getting food to these countries as quickly as we could. We haven't had to deal with that kind of crisis, that kind of political food political crisis for a long time. And now we're faced with the prospect of having that reemerge as a big part of our foreign policy. I mean, you look at the food riots that occurred you know, in Egypt and Bangladesh and Mexico. You look at the government of Haiti that fell because of food riots. And you remember that the French Revolution began as what? A bread riot. You recognize that, that this, you know, the, the potential for this is huge. And yet we haven't had to deal with that for about half a century. So it's a long way of saying, I think we're going to get a little break from food prices, but at the same time, I don't think we should look at those as a sort of an instrument for improving the system. 
it's different, it, it, to, to, to labor this point a bit, if you look at energy prices, those are an instrument for moving change. But because, because there are alternative forms of energy, people can do without energy or do with considerably less. And we've shown that in this country and elsewhere. Food, it's harder to replace. Oh, sorry. Yeah, my name is Tom Lively, and I work for Organically Grown Company. And uh, me and my wife operate what you'd call a truly small farm. Uh, and yet, when I get in front of groups, I always love to throw the bomb and say that Organically Grown Company, as much as we respect and like working with truly small farms, we're not worried about them uh, because we think that they can kind of re replicate themselves fairly easy. Uh, you go out and rent a couple acres, get a rototiller and some seed, you know, and you start going. Uh, I liked your comment about medium-sized farms or mid-sized farms because those are the farms that we're really concerned about. Those are the farms that are really hard to replicate. You need a skilled owner operator. You need a land base. You need equipment. You need a management structure. Uh, you need capital. Finance. And those are the farms. And those farms, my farm creates pounds. Those are the farms that create tons. And so that dialogue we constantly hear, small and large. I think that dialogue really needs to change to more of that medium-sized concept. This, I mean, this is, a, this is really important because, as you point out, we need that, that muscle, that scale muscle, to be able to produce the kind of food we're talking about. You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss for a term here, but maybe the alternative sector, if you will, has been sort of stuck in the margins for a long time, both in terms of its appeal but also in terms of the supply. I mean, if you go to Europe where they're very... When they promote this stuff heavily and subsidize it heavily, it's still a relatively small part of the supply. How do we push this out? How, what's the next step? And you know, when you start considering, how is it that you attract the next stage of farmers to come in? I mean, what are farmers afraid of when, it, when, when it, the transition to organic? Well, they're, I mean, they're afraid of a lot of things, but one of them is the risk of that transition period. Three years, okay, three years, what's gonna to happen to my cash flow? What, what am I gonna tell my banker during that three year period? Um, what happens if when I get done, the market for that particular thing is, is not as hot? What if the margins that people can charge for organic aren't as high? I mean, how do you help farmers overcome these risks? Because that's been the whole attraction to the industrial model is risk has been reduced. You know, you don't have to do your experimenting on the farm, it's done for you by Monsanto, it's done for you by Syngenta. You know, Convincing a whole generation of farmers to sort of re-embrace risk is going to be pretty tough, and yet that's what has to happen. But what about this? What about not putting the onus simply on the farmer? What about embracing the notion of a, a broader definition for what alternative food is? I mean, I don't, you know, I hate to use the word almost organic, but you know, many of, of you who produce organic know that we're sort of there already. I mean, it's very, very difficult to ensure that everything you use and put on your field is absolutely organic. Given the nature of, of the business world, it's very tough. And you look at some farmers that are experimenting with things like, you know, no-till wheat farming. There's a guy up at Fred Fleming. I don't know if people are familiar with him down here, but he has got a great system up in eastern Washington that you know uses no-till seed drills for wheat farming. He's reduced his soil erosion substantially, and yet because he's not tilling, he gets weeds. So he controls them with a little bit of Roundup. I realize Roundup is not a, 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 an attractive word in this group, but you know he has reduced his Roundup use substantially. He's reduced runoff and erosion from his uh, lands, I mean, incredibly. That should count for something. Yet, he, he, obviously, he can't charge the organic premium, and he sometimes gets grief from the organic community, and yet he's doing something that's, I think, valuable. How do we sort of broaden our definition of sort of sustainable food to include people like Fred Fleming? There's a guy at Iowa State who's come up with, um, uh, he's come up with a, a, a model of controlling weeds by promoting populations of seed predators, you know, mice and insects that eat the seeds of weeds. So he, the, the, the little rodents that farmers sp spent decades trying to get rid of, he actually encourages. Now he manages to, to reduce his need for um, herbicides by 75%. And because, he's using, he's, he, and because he's including this model in a rotation model that uses cover crops, he also reduces his need for nitrogen fertilizer by about 80%. Now, these don't qualify as organic, and yet they're doing substantial improvements to the environment. How do we include that model? I guess what I'm asking is, are there ways to sort of take alternative farming to the next level to include a broader audience without losing, without getting on that slippery slope? Because obviously you can see yourself saying, well, if I reduce my you know, pesticide use by 3%, so I get a star, you know. I, I mean, obviously we'd have to have standards, but 
it may be time to start asking those questions. You know, ideally we would get a reduction in cost so we'd appeal to more mainstream consumers, but we'd also be able to attract farmers who are deathly afraid of taking on more risk, particularly now. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, my question is related to peak oil because it's something you know a lot about, and it's the reason I went into farming. I decided that I should start growing my own food and maybe producing food for my community. And it seems like all these examples are still tied in with this shipping system, this distribution system that we have that's completely dependent on cheap fossil fuels. And when that's ending within my lifetime, I'm going to see that change rapidly. So as a farmer, I want to, you know, talk about dialogue or discourse. You know, I, I can only see food being sustainable in, as a local thing for me because it's, you know, how can I deliver my food? How can I feed my community? How can local farms in my area work together to provide a year-round food supply that looks, you know, and feels like meeting grocery store, um, what someone would expect to get a grocery store, bread and eggs and milk, you know, all the things that they need safely and in a way that doesn't depend on things. I mean, I'm on the coast, things that, you know, not even coming from the valley. We're looking at that. How do we grow grain on the coast and things, you know, how can we meet, how can we grow things that give us the carbohydrates that we need? So can you talk about that? I mean, it seems like that's part of the discourse that needs to happen. I think absolutely. So the question is transportation. We have a model. And we're really all, in, we're all operating in the context of things that can be shipped a long way. I mean, even if we all ate entirely local, we're all wearing things. We're sitting in chairs. I mean, you know, our life is, is global. So how long can that be sustainable? And shouldn't that be part of the discussion? So there's a couple of points to be made. The first is that you know, we're, this, this discussion would seem a lot more natural last summer when oil was you know, trading at $147 a barrel. Now that it's cheap again, you can see the, sort of the world relaxing. You can feel, I mean, you look at the miles being driven. Um, it's beginning to creep back up again after the, first, after the first drop in decades. And what was even more disturbing to me is we, we, the, the SUV to sedan ratio is now back in favor of SUVs. That didn't take long. You know? it's, almost, it's back to where it was in uh, apparently 2006. So these price signals matter when it comes to energy. So clearly, um, we can't rely on the market to make this change for us. That doesn't stop us or shouldn't stop us from recognizing that we have a system that's highly dependent on cheap oil and that so much of the, the retail food model is based on being able to get, say, year-round produce in a global sourcing system. How long can that be sustained under um, expensive energy? Well, uh, you know, we're having to rethink the notion of peak oil. I mean, oil is finite and it will peak, but we've just shown in the last couple of years that there's a lot more oil out there that's accessible. We've had improvements in technology that we didn't anticipate. So now we've got the prospect of cheaper oil for a few years. On the, consumers will be happy with that because right now it's like a tax break. But in terms of sort of driving change and making people think about the things that you're talking about, we're going to lose some of that encouragement. In the end, though, we know prices will go back up. We we're having this discussion again. I think what we need to keep in mind is that as important as it will be to emphasize local and regional, we have to understand that those have limits. And that it may make a lot of sense in a, in a place like this or a place like California where you've got incredible, you know, uh, natural assets and you have a long season that local and regional makes sense but it's a little harder to make that argument in a place like Alaska um, and, and you realize that a lot of the way that we live today has to do with the fact that we could ship food there and if it was if oil had been expensive all this whole century obviously our living patterns would be different well that's not the case we live where we live even though if we move to a regional and local system we have to understand again where it has limits and we also have to recognize that you know, you know Countries like China and India are already past the point where they can feed themselves. I mean, you can argue whether if they change their diet and change their model, they could get a few more years of self-sufficiency. But the point is that their population trends will at some point push them over the point where they can feed themselves. They will require imports. There's nothing they can do about that. At the same time, countries like the United States have the capacity to produce uh, exportable surpluses. If you go look at the Midwest, we can do it. Even in an entirely sustainable model, we could be producing more grain than we need in this country. So there's a natural relationship between the United States and China and India that is going to be supported by trade. It is long distance trade. It will require fuel. But I think what's important to keep in mind is if we're limiting our long distance trade to bulk commodities, that's one thing. That may be where we, can, we decide that we can afford to, you know, to expend the fuel. It'll be another thing if we're talking about shipping Belgian endive back and forth in 747s. 
So I think what we really need to recognize is that trade has to become more rational in terms of the kinds of things we're sending, on top of being more just and fair. But ultimately, we're not going to do away with trade. I mean, um, you know, Oregon, you know, you, a one, per, one orchardist, a pear orchardist can probably produce enough pears to supply most of Oregon. You know, so, so what are you going to do with that extra? You have superb pear growing um, talents in this, in this state. So you need the capacity to move your surplus, um, your, comparative, your competitive advantage. You need the capacity to sell that elsewhere. Maybe you don't end up selling it in Beijing. But I think we need to be very careful about limiting ourselves to local and regional. It doesn't, or, or I think we need to go back and look at where those make sense and maybe where they need to merge and work in with a hierarchy of other scales. Again, complexity is the order of the day. And I've heard a lot of people who think, you know, who will argue that, you know, if it's not local, um, they're not interested in it. And I know that's not what you're arguing. I think you're wanting to emphasize that. But really what we need to be doing is emphasizing it and understanding where it fits in but being open to the idea that we may have to have broader scales. You know, and again, it's not, an, it's not a neat package, it's not a single solution, but it does, I think, reflect the complexity that we're going to be facing. I want to get back to what we were talking about before, and you, you talk about um, food and risk um, for the farmers, and how do you convince farmers to move to um, organics when there's so much higher risk, but I think the question needs to go the other direction, and we need to say, how do we convince um, the people that are using chemicals um, to stop using them. And if the true cost of that use was incorporated into the products that they're selling, then I believe that that chemical use would no longer become um, economically viable. So I think we need to flip the question. That's a, that's a totally fair analysis. I mean, if, if a farmer, when they put on nitrogen fertilizer, had to you know, pay for some of the cost of dealing with the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, they would probably be less likely to over-fertilize as a form of insurance, because that's you know, what, we, what we tend to do. Um, you notice that as fertilizer prices went up, farmers were getting more and more accurate in terms of their fertilizer applications. And in fact, we're seeing a lot more of the satellite-assisted, you know, where you have a tractor that can go over and say, OK, this particular square yard needs less fertilizer. This one needs more. Those kinds of technologies can help. I, but I think that. You know, until a farmer is forced to, you know, take into account the costs, they're not. They're going to behave as if it's a freebie. So, but where do we reinsert those costs in the system? You know, what, that's why one of, we keep going back to this notion of a carbon tax or a cap and trade. You know, carbon is one of those things that is associated with nearly all human activities. It is obviously something we want to reduce. It's probably the the most. Uh, it's probably the most effective way to begin re reintroducing the true costs of producing anything, in this case, food. Um, and now we're, we're politically sort of poised to begin moving on this. Um, you know, check in in a year. I mean, it'll be really interesting to see whether we make the Copenhagen deadline. I don't think we're going to. I don't, the Copenhagen deadline is we're supposed to have sort of an international agreement on emission targets by December 7th. It's funny that they would predict the, pick that date. <laughs> but. But I, and I, I, think that's, I think that's too ambitious. I don't think we're actually going to make that. But I do think there's enough momentum, political momentum now, um, particularly since November, that we'll have something within 18 months. And then the question is, do we want cap and trade or do we want a tax? Cap and trade is the one that everyone's moving toward. But if you talk to economists, they feel a tax is more efficient. Um, and then you hear companies like Exxon saying they support a tax, which automatically makes you think, hmm, there must be something wrong with it. But <laughs> that's a, well, it, de it depends, because they're still going to be in a competitive marketplace. They won't be able to push, you know, they're going to have to change the way they do business as well. Mostly, I think what Exxon is interested in a tax is because it knows in the United States tax means political death. It'll never pass. So they want to promote something that will never pass. But that, that's neither here nor there. There was a... Oh, okay. My comment is brief. I just wanted to say we keep endorsing the other food system by calling it conventional. Uh -huh. I think that needs to be changed. Fair, fair enough. Maybe we could spend the last minute coming up with another, well. Reactionary. Reactionary, OK. <laughs> now, I don't know if this is constructive. Uh, in any case, um, I want to um, wish you all the best for the rest of this conference. This stuff is really important. 
and we're in a unique opportunity, or we're in a, we're in a position that, that affords us a unique opportunity right now, where you have basically the ear of the nation, but you know, the nation is, recognizes the need for change. It doesn't know which way to go. It's very fearful. It's afraid that, of anything that costs more. And yet, when you talk to people about their food, the optimism and the confidence that this nation has had in its food supply for most of the last century, that, comp that optimism is, is, is gone. You know, we're sort of waiting for what happens. I mean, we're right in the middle of a, this like peanut scare that's just like it's made in Hollywood. It's just, it's unbelievable. You know, you think, okay, what, what were they thinking? And yet you recognize that the system, it's not just the players, it's the system that they have. Um, now the next, the, 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 the question that the nation has for us is, okay, what? What next? And I think that's part of the, the work that you're going to be doing over the next couple of days and the next uh, years. Thank you very much for your attention and good luck with the rest of the conference. You've been listening to journalist and author Paul Roberts speaking at the Organicology Conference in Portland, Oregon on February 27, 2009. To find out more about Paul Roberts and his work, please visit his website at theendoffood.com. To find out more about the Organicology Conference, please visit the Oregon Tilth website at www.tilth.org. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions. To find out more about our work and to access our growing library of free, on-demand streaming video and audio programs, please visit our website at www.pdxjustice.org. You'll find programs featuring speakers such as Robert McChesney, Barbara Ehrenreich, Prothop Chatterjee, Amira Haas, and Rashid Khalidi. If you'd like to comment on any of our programs, or if you have any questions, please write to us at pdxjustice at riseup.net. And if you support our work, please link to our website, tell others about our programs, and consider a donation to help us continue to provide this free online news and public affairs service. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, independent bookstores, and all forms of grassroots, democratic community media.